Well, good morning. Thank you for being here today. Uh, yeah, my name is TJ. I am the Next Gen Pastor, and uh, Stephen didn't know this 10 years ago. Um, I'm going to pull myself together because great is thy faithfulness was staying in this room at our wedding, and uh, that was in August, so special today, so I appreciate that. Um, I tried to turn around to my wife and smile at her, and she's got her eyes closed worshiping the Lord, so I'm, I don't know what I'm doing, but you know, I, shows you where my head's at, but um, what a great day. We sang uh, a worship the king in the chapel earlier today, and I shared the story about my, my college professor who, ref, who referred to his, uh, all of his class uh, as frail children of dust. I don't know if that was a compliment or not, but I was trying to just connect with him on, on all those things. But then we sang Be Thou My Vision. We sang that at, uh, at my graduation in college. So just a day of, of nostalgia for me. So Steve and I appreciate that. And the God, that's God working and through you, brother, to serve our church. And I, I appreciate that. But uh, as Rodney shared, it's hot. So uh, he should have just given the sermon to you know, for some generosity. I don't know if that should have connected with us today, but uh, we are going to continue in our series uh, in Galatians this morning. Uh, I, I grew up drinking a lot of soda. Anybody else in here where you just drank soda your whole life and then you got older, you got smart, and you said, man, there's sure is a lot of sugar in this stuff, so we need to kind of put that away. Uh, I, I grew up going to uh, D Nows. I grew up going to, uh, we had Things like Dean Owls, we had retreats, we had different things. We were in Albuquerque, so it was, it was a different context. But there was soda readily available at all of these different things. There was, I mean, you could, everything you could imagine. But slowly what happened was, is our adult leaders started introducing some of these other beverages. Something like, instead of Dr. Pepper, we would have Dr. Thunder. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what Dr. Thunder? Okay. I don't know what the equivalent to, to Coca-Cola was. It was kooky cola for all, for, all I, for all I was concerned. I was like, this is not what I imagined here. But my awesome adult leaders, you know, oh, I just, it's fine. It's the same thing. Just, just drink that. It's going to be just fine. And in my head, I'm going like, this is not, this is not right. Like, you, you are selling me, you are selling me a lie here. This is a fraud. This is a fraud. No way. But like over time, you just start drinking it. You just start, you know, hey, yeah, this is the same exact thing. This t- that you're trying to tell your friends, you're like, this is the same exact thing as drinking the real stuff. And they kind of look at you like, nah, man, I don't know what you're, talking, <laughs> what you're talking about. You've been sold a lie. And as I got smarter, as I got older, and I started drinking the real stuff again, I was like, man, this stuff's way better. Like, I don't know what they were giving me over here. Like, man, you guys were lying to me this whole time. Well, in a similar way, this is what the Galatians are experiencing with the gospel. Paul's telling them, he's just going like, look, I'm the one who, I have, I have, I have seen the gospel. I have received one gospel, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I received it straight from him. I received it straight from the source. And that's what makes it valid, and that's what makes it true. And so these, these Galatians were being sold a lie. So what we're going to see today is that we're all broken because of our sin. We're in bondage and we all need the gospel to free us. I believe it's brokenness that actually is what connects each and every one of us to this story. And the gospel frees us. And so that freedom is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what we'll discover today is that the gospel frees us to obey. It frees us to let go and it frees us to be free. And we'll see that really obedience is kind of the platform to do X, Y, and Z as we follow Jesus, and I'll unpack those as we, as we dive into our passage. But before we jump into our text, I do think it's helpful for us to see just some of the background, some of the context of kind of what's happening during the time of this letter. Most believe this is the very first letter that Paul writes in his ministry. He wrote this in 51 AD, and so many compare this letter to, to Romans, just because of the content. Now you'd be looking at Romans and if you've grown up in the church or you grew up around the Bible, you know the Bible, Romans is 16 chapters. It's like, there is no way this is the same, this is the same letter. This is a little fully more developed here. But that's because Paul had to write this very quickly because there was something happening in Galatia that he was specifically going to address and these young believers needed some help. 
And so this section that we're going to be in today in Galatians 1 is actually an autobiography. Uh, and this is the first, kind of the first part of that. It carries all the way uh, through, kind of through chapter 2. And he is specifically addressing what the Judaizers are teaching these Galatians. You're like, okay, well, who, who are they? And you could call the Judaizers, you could call them Jesus followers if you wanted to. But like I mentioned, they were selling a lie because they were saying, hey, you need to actually convert to Judaism before you begin following Jesus. And so these Judaizers that shown up in Galatia, and the, the Galatians have this, this pagan background. They don't have a lot, of, uh, had a lot of traditions with the scriptures. They don't really know how to really fight all of this. And so this is what sets up the letter. And so we'll discover more about the law, its meaning, its role later in our series. I'll have the opportunity to preach in Galatians 3 here in about a month. But for today, we're going to be in in Galatians 1, 11 through 24. And so I invite you to follow along with me as we read this together. Just helpful if you have, if you take notes or you highlight your whatever you want to do in the Bible app. It's a great, uh, a great app that you can have. This is what Paul says, starting in verse 11 of chapter 1 in Galatians. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and my father's or sorry, (laughs) among my people, hello. Let me read that again, just so we're all following along. I'm in verse 14, and I'm just like jumping around here. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Verse 15, but when he he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. And then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I, I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So I want you to see three things as we move through this text together. The first one is the gospel frees us to obey. The gospel frees us to obey. As Paul states, this was not man's gospel. This is straight from Jesus Christ. His, his, his language is something like, hey, let me make this perfectly clear. I receive this from no one else other than Jesus. I'm like one of the apostles. He is arguing for some of his apostleship. He's saying, look, I spent time with Jesus. He revealed himself to me on the road to Damascus. And the gospel's valid because of how it, was, how it was received. It's like the validity, validity of the law. It was divinely received. It wasn't created by man. This is a key point when you're, when you're trying to deal with a group of people who are just being heavily influenced by Judaism. So what Paul's saying is that he did not acquire this information from any man, or better put, it was not handed down from tradition that was passed on through the ages. This was what Paul was fighting against. He received it directly from Jesus Himself And his opponents, however, can only appeal to, tradi- to tradi- tradition, which is full of rules and laws that need to be followed. And Paul's pointing out that there's one thing essential for intimacy with God. It's not about doing all these other things out of obligation to achieve some sort of status with God. Uh, this, is, this is modern day cultural Christianity. Right? I am a Christian because I've always been one. Or like I kind of sometimes do all these different things. You know, my parents, they, they, you know, they came to church all the time. Or we're, you know, we're associated with this church in the neighborhood. That doesn't make you a believer. That, just, that only hides your flaws. If you've tried to purchase a house in, in recent days, God bless you. It's crazy out there, I know, all right? 
But you can get on a website, right? And you can kind of virtually tour this home and they put up all these pictures and this house looks amazing. Oh, it looks good. Oh, hey, look, this is not too, not too bad. And then you get inside the home and sometimes when you step inside a house, there are certain smells that do not come through a computer screen. <laughs> and you go, huh, this, they have a lot of animals that lived in this house, I guess. I'm not, I'm not sure. Or you don't notice some of the other quirks or you don't notice some of the other issues that are not revealed online. I mean, this is what makes social media so prevalent. And so popular is because I can live a different life online. I can put up a facade that makes it look like I live the perfect life. It's a facade to make it look better than it really is. And that's all the traditionalism in Judaism is or cultural Christianity or anything else that makes Christianity a facade to make me look better than I really am. The things I do, how I look, help me have a better standing with God and with others. You know what that's really called? It's called brokenness. We're broken because of our sin and so we, we, we believe we can hide behind the mask of religion in order to achieve holiness. Knowledge of the gospel does not constitute receiving the gospel. Receiving it implies that he or she has made it his or her own. This is what Paul did. Paul owned it. Paul adopted it. It became the core of who he was rather than something he just cognitively understood. And he responded in obedience rather than seeing something as an obligation. That's part of my personal testimony. I grew up in the church. My dad is a pastor and my mom taught three-year-old, uh, three-year-old Sunday school. She, uh, she, she sang in the choir but that didn't make me a believer, that didn't make me a Christian. I mean, I'm a pastor's kid, y'all, like we need help. Like pastor's kids need Jesus too, okay? We got problems. But thanks be to God for God introducing the gospel through my parents. And I obediently responded. I was not born a Christian. The Bible does not teach that. And so the response is one of obedience, or maybe a better word is surrender. Once someone hears the gospel, there's a response that's warranted. For Paul, it was hearing his name called on the road to Damascus and Jesus revealing himself to Paul. And so to respond, he had to see how broken he was. The, tradi the traditions of the past were not gonna carry him into a life of obedience. See, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus does not ask us to put ourselves together before responding to him in obedience. He speaks identity into our lives and we can respond by saying, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm yours. And so what's your response? Perhaps you've lived your whole life just thinking, saying, hey, I'm saved by my works or I'm, I, yeah, I'm saved by my obligations or because your, pa your parents are, your grandparents are. I mean, do you believe that you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone? Or have you never trusted Christ? And you can do that today. You can receive his grace and you can respond obediently by handing your life over to him. See, following Jesus is not about doing a bunch of stuff so that we're loved. We're loved, therefore we obey as opposed to we obey, therefore we're loved. You are exchanging your life of rituals and just checking a box for a life that is full of joy, that is full of purpose. Essentially, this is what Paul is sharing with us and it's available for you as well. So this leads into our next point or sets us up. It's, it's not only does the gospel free us to obey, but the, now the gospel frees us to let go. The gospel frees us to let go. There's two parts to this. There's the, the first is that we have to let go of our past. We have to let go of our past. Verse 13, this is, this is what Paul continues to write to the Galatians. He says, you have seen my former life of Judaism. Basically, he says, and I tried to destroy it by trying to kill believers, and I was really good at it. 
So there's now evidence of this, of this life change. Paul has let go of the past. He's been freed from the bondage of the religion. Paul is like, a, he's like a prodigy. I mean, the Greek word they use here is it for, it for advancing in verse 14. That's the same word that shows up in, in Luke 2.52 when they're talking about Jesus. I mean, he was highly honored and already had access to the high priest in, in Acts 7.58. But he no longer values that. He's let it go. So you get into verse 14, we find out his specialty was in knowledge of the law and the knowledge of the traditions of Judaism. Pharisees were obsessed with the traditions of their fathers. They were zealous for the law and the traditions associated with Judaism. Pharisees dominated Jerusalem. And Paul got to experience the power, the honor, the fame of being this top religious leader while being zealous for the things that actually got him there. But Paul's zeal was placed in the wrong thing. See, zeal expressing itself in violence was actually encouraged. I mean, they're they're biblical examples like like Phineas. I mean, he makes a kebab out out of a Jewish man and a Moabite woman. And he's actually rewarded for it. God God makes a a covenant with him. But this is the whole reason Paul has to just go away. He has to go into Arabia. He tells us in verse 17, he has to detox from Judaism. He has this zeal. He has this passion. And again, zeal itself is not necessarily bad as Paul just starts talking about, uh, not just talking about persecuting the church, the zeal's bad when it's misplaced, and it was misplaced in Jewish ideas. His zeal was a form of traditionalism. And traditions aren't bad. There are traditions that help bring glory to God. The issue at hand here is traditionalism. And so Travis and, and I, as, as we were preparing this week, Travis Cook is, is preaching in the Great Hall today. He helped me kind of walk through what, what traditionalism actually looks like, but it's, kind of, it's largely made of three things. One is it's a good idea. No one gets traditional uh, about bad ideas. And then there's time. When a good idea becomes an okay idea, then it becomes familiar or it becomes comfortable. And then there's fear, the third thing. Our, our traditions become a place to hide when we cease to understand what the spirit is now doing. And so traditional becomes a barrier to intimacy with God. See, when we care more about how something is done or we care more about how something is performed or doing it the right way, we miss out on what God may be trying to tell us or how, may he, how he may be trying to transform us. So without fear, you have traditions and those are good. But when fear enters, you have traditionalism. And so Paul, as a Pharisee, was afraid of the new gospel movement. That's the whole reason he persecutes it. But this zeal, however, is then turned towards God's efforts. He lets go of the the traditions of his past and his success in Judaism for the sake of Christ. This is what the gospel allows for us to leave behind. Jesus calls us out to leave our fear behind behind. We have no fear when we rest in the love and grace of Jesus. So look, I understand I'm I'm talking a lot about traditions in a a room, in a service that most would call traditional. I did the same thing in the chapel this morning. And so Travis is saying some of the similar things in the great hall. So if you have issues, just email Travis, okay? We're just going to blame him this morning, okay? But even so, that may not be the case for you. There are other things that we may be afraid to let go of or feel like we can't just overcome. Another word for tradition is a habit. A tradition can be something that brings comfort or helps us escape, but when we're afraid to let go of some things, that can drive a wedge between us and full intimacy with Jesus. That habit can be an addiction. And you know you need to let go there may be something from your past that you're just saying, like, I, can't, I cannot let go of this. And you just have trouble releasing it. The shame, the guilt, the, all, the, all the things that you feel just grips you and you think you will never be able to let go of it. 
And there's nothing you can do and there's nothing you've done that will make Jesus love you more. Make Jesus love you or more less than he already does. We are freed by the gospel and can let go of the things that hold us in bondage. Legalism, addictions, fear, guilt, shame. The gospel releases us for freedom. The second part of of letting go involves our, our present. We have to let go of our present. The word but here reminds me of the phrase Paul uses in Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy, here, but, but when he who had set me apart. Basically, I was doing this thing. I was living this life. God intervened, and now I am completely doing something different. There's only one person responsible for Paul's present spiritual state. The person and the work of Jesus Christ. Despite Paul's past, God had set him apart for the work of the gospel. He says, before I was born. Very similar to what's being written in Jeremiah 1. God has called him into mission. And Jesus is redefining Paul's present state. Instead of Paul running immediately to to Jerusalem, he instead, he goes to like this, he goes through fish camp with Jesus for three years. See, the danger for most of us is that we immediately want to just run to getting ourselves right are making sure our kids are happy, are making sure our kids are healthy. We look at our present situation and go, okay, hey, yeah, it's time, it's time to fix this. Spiritually, I'm gonna read my Bible more, I'm gonna go to church more. Physically, I'm gonna start exercising and I'm gonna start eating healthy. For our kids, we enter them into every camp and study group and activity known to man because we think that's what provides comfort. We just want them to be set up for success. And so much of our energy and our effort go toward making our present experience line up with what we think our present should look like. And guess what? We get frustrated. We get irritated. We get anxious. We get tired. And we get fearful when none of those things happen. And so then you start another cycle and you never get off the hamster wheel. We wanna fix it ourselves, completely natural. Whatever that is, right, work work harder, do more, or get get, get our kids involved in in more and so on, and do you know what that's called? Brokenness. We're broken. It happens when we replace or exchange a life with Jesus for a life of busyness. And all he is calling us into is intimacy with him. But God, who called me by his grace. That's how he calls you and me. Through his grace. He calls us out of the rat race so we can find purpose with him. And when we obey, if we go back to our first point, we are released from the burdens we've placed on ourselves. We are free to let go and develop a relationship with the Savior. It's because I'm not sure, so I'm not, I'm not sure any of you have like a three-year retreat with Jesus planned, or you can put that on your calendar for this year. I'm not sure any of you can do that. I know I can't do that. But what if it was three hours a week? Or what if, what if it was committing to three o'clock at every day? You just said, I'm gonna spend three minutes with Jesus because I just want to unplug for a little bit and just have some, some time with my Lord. It's an opportunity to sit with Jesus. He frees us to let go so that we can be with him, freed from the pressure to perform and freed from the pressure to keep up. And this is where we'll pick up our final point. The gospel frees us to be free. The gospel frees us to be free. Last week, Pastor Jeff defined biblical freedom as he opened our, our series. He says, we, we learned that, that biblical freedom is not doing whatever you want to do, it's doing what you ought to do. 
That's what Paul shows us here and throughout the rest of the letter. We're free to live in response to what Jesus has done for us. Again, it's no longer about doing the things to get right. Instead, it's, it's being free to live on mission and to share in the spoils of that, that freedom. It's not being free to just do whatever. That's still a form of bondage. It's kind of like what happened at the end of, of World War II. When the Soviets liberated a concentration camp, they would, they would say, hey, congratulations, you're free. You may leave. And the prisoners would go, hey, where, I mean, to where? Like, what, what do we do with what? Why, I mean, I don't have anything. It was just a different kind of shackle or prison. But when the Western allies freed them, they received food, they received clothing, medicine, and they were cared for. They were freer because they were being treated like humans. They were freer under the power uh, under, under the uh, under the power and protection of the allies, rather than just being free to do whatever they wanted. This is what the gospel does for us. It sets us free. We're under the, the under the protection and the care of the Savior. He gives us purpose and He shapes us for mission. It's as if Paul's just saying, "Hey, okay, so what's what's next?" And Jesus does, just, Jesus does freedom to do whatever he pleases. He says, I've got something special for you. And he provides opportunities for us as well. I'm going to briefly look at two of those. One is he frees us for community. He frees us for community. We, we need each other. He frees us to be in community with other believers. It means we are free to be vulnerable. We can freely share our struggles, our hurts, our pain, our joy, our celebrations, all without the fear of judgment. Again, you can't hide behind this facade. Brokenness is what actually leads to hiding things. We are free to share with each other so that we can lift up one another. The gospel levels the playing field for each of us. And so we have, we have groups and we have classes that if you're, look, you're, you're a guest today going like, I, I just, I need people. I want to be in community with other people. You can find us out in the lobby and we'd love to get you connected. But not only are we freed for community, we're also freed to be sent. He frees us for mission. Paul receives the gospel and he's immediately commissioned And one of the commentaries we read this week called the apostles commissioned agents. This is what Jesus is doing. He's commissioning us for service. The gospel changes our lives and we are immediately sent into the world. You 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 are sent into your home to spread the good news with your family. You are sent into your workplace to be a light for those who need to see hope. And they need to see somebody who can rest in gospel peace each day. You're sent into your friend groups to be with them during hard and difficult times. And we're sent into our city and we're sent into our world to share the hope of Jesus Christ. And through each and every one of those situations, you're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel. You now have purpose. And others will begin to glorify God because of what you're doing. So to recap, we're free to obey We're free to let go of the things that keep us in bondage. And we're freed so that we can be free, so that we can experience community, so we can have purpose. And it's all because of the gospel. So this is for all of us today. You can trust Jesus today. You can begin a new journey with him. For others, this is a reminder that we are free in Christ. And so maybe you've never given your life to Jesus because you've been sold a complete lie your entire life. You can trust him today. So if you're a guest with us, you need to know this, that we, we exist to lead all generations to love Jesus. What that means is that when you step foot on our campus or you step foot in one of our groups, we want you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as I mentioned before, you can receive him today. If God is speaking to you now, will you, will you surrender your life to him? You can admit you're broken. You can admit that you need rescue. 
and then you believe the gospel, that Jesus alone is the one who came to save you, that he stood in your place to die on your sin and was rose on the third day to give you eternal life. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And then you commit your life to him. And Jesus becomes Lord of your life. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray in a moment and you can, you can tell God those things however you, feel, however you feel led. Or you can find me, you can find someone else. We'll be out in the lobby after our service. And we would love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you further about some of those things. Because then believers are, are baptized as a response to their salvation. It's, just an, it's an act of obedience that represents what Jesus has done in your life. I also mentioned about getting connected with, with other people. And we want you to have relationships with other people. So if you wanna explore what it looks like to be in a group, you wanna explore what it looks like to be in a class again, we can help you find somewhere where you can be connected. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing a couple songs as we, as we head out today. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful for the gospel. I'm grateful for it because it's changed my life. I'm grateful for, for the story that we've read today, for your word. And God, I pray for anybody in this room that's wrestling what it means to follow Jesus, God, will you just, will you help them? Will you speak to them? Will you give them hope? God, I'm grateful for our church. God, that we are passionate about leading all generations to love Jesus. Because it is you, it is your son that why we're here. So God, as we leave this place, as we go into our week to serve, as we go into our homes, as we go into our, our, our workspaces, God, remind us, for those that are in Christ, that we are commissioned, that we are sent into the world to be light. So God, may you be glorified through what we do, for what we, through what we say. And it's your name we pray. Amen.